Alhamdulillah, This might be the last uh, class with regard to uh, the compilation preservation of the Quran. But if we have more questions, we can go for one for the fourth class because of the importance of the of the topic. Okay. Um, so we went through the process of compiling and preserving the Quran. Um, when you want to, in general, if you want to know the authenticity of any text, there are scientific ways to analyze that. Uh, first of all, going back to historical facts in general, or historical events, or historical texts, the only way that you gain knowledge about these texts is reliable transmission. Um, and that is one of the sources of knowledge in general. Uh, some people say, okay, I only believe in what I see, or I only believe in something that I can test. Uh, uh, those, this is like the materialistic approach. But even those people who are materialistic, they are also relying on uh, the source of knowledge, which is the trustworthy transmission. Uh, why is that? Like, for instance, even the, the scientific facts that they rely upon and the scientific experiments that have been performed in the past, those are being relayed to them through reliable transmission as well. And they take the, those, uh, this information and they build on it. If every human being had to go back and invent the wheel and start every kind of test and experiment humanity has went through till they reach this age of advance uh, and progress in science, then we would be going in circles at the same step and the same level forever. But human beings in general rely on or accept reliable and trustworthy transmission of information as a source of knowledge. We do this, actually this is the main source of knowledge in general for us. Even in our, in our daily dealings or daily life, uh, we listen to the news and we basically just try to verify and analyze different sources of news to come to uh, uh, the conviction of what is the truth about the, regarding that event, for instance. Uh, everybody, each one of us has heard of a city called Beijing in China, but most of us have not visited it. But we all know for a fact there is a city called Beijing, and if somebody comes and doubts that, based on the fact that he hasn't visited it, and he hasn't got, uh, seen it himself uh, physically, would that be reasonable? Mm -hmm. If somebody doubts that there's a city called Beijing in China? No, exactly not. If, the, if somebody doubts that there's the president by such a, such a name, have you ever, for instance, uh, met uh, Obama or Donald Trump? You haven't met these, those guys, but n now we see them on TV. But even if it was just transmitted by radio, it would have been sufficient because this recurrent information from multiple sources is reliable enough to confirm that this information is trust trustworthy. When it comes to historical facts, there's a science behind, no, or a historical text, there's a science and well-known uh, principles that have to be followed to confirm the authenticity of that text or whether it is forged or fabricated. That is, well, you know what that science is called? It's called textual criticism, right? Textual criticism. Have you heard this name before? Textual criticism? And they divide it into higher criticism and lower criticism. It's mostly used now, because the only source for, for instance, the Bible, the Old Testament and New Testament is to try to compare and contrast between different manuscripts. So they have something called textual criticism, which is trying to compare the different things that they unearth. They find, an, uh, for instance, a chapter such and such, and they find a manuscript uh, of that chapter. But they have other manuscripts, and they try to compare and contrast and cross-match to try to come to what the original text was, was like, okay? That is the only source that they can rely upon for trying to write uh, the Bible. But they don't have any kind of reliable oral transmission dating back to Jesus. They don't have that. They don't have any reliable oral transmission dating back to Moses. That's not even existent. They don't have that. Alhamdulillah, for us Muslims, we have extremely reliable oral transmission dating back to Prophet Sallallahu with regards to every part of our religion, and every text of our religion. As for the Quran, it is not only those reciters, the famous reciters, who transmitted the Qur'an by innumerable chains of narration down to us, but it is the whole Muslim nation and ummah, starting from the time of the Prophet ﷺ, where he had, hundred, had tens of thousands of companions, and those transmitted to the second generation, hundreds of thousands, 
then to hundreds of thousands, to millions, and so on, up until now. So it is a whole nation that everybody is reciting the Quran in his house, everybody is praying with the Quran, uh, everybody is teaching. Uh, even the Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet, uh, it is mentioned in the narration that whenever somebody embraces Islam, Prophet used to appoint a Sahabi immediately to teach him the Quran. That's the first thing. You come and you embrace Islam, so he says, okay, you, uh, you are responsible for teaching him whatever you know of the Quran. And Prophet Sallallahu as you know, taught the Sahaba the Quran directly, and he, he had daily sessions teaching the Quran on top of the daily recitation of the Quran. And as I mentioned, that they would complete the whole Quran. If you count how many pages they read every, every day, then they would complete the whole Quran at least once every month, and so on. Um, I just brought you a, an example of the chains, a chain of narration. For instance, this is the chain of narration of the reciter uh, Azim, Hafsan Azim. Imagine, I just want to give a picture of this, this page here to show the number of names of different people who participated in reporting to us one single uh, way of uh, recitation of the Quran. Okay, you have up here, he says here, Rabbul Izza Jalla Jalal, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Then says Jibreel, so Jibreel, angel Jibreel is the one who transmitted the Quran. Says then, then Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. From the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there's a list of Sahaba. Those are the scholars of the Sahaba, the most reliable. As I mentioned to you about, we, we estimated about 10,000 Sahaba, 10,000 companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam memorized the whole Quran. That's the memorizers of the whole Quran. Probably if you take the ones who memorize parts of the Quran, one third, one fourth, one fifth, yani, you'll find most of the Sahaba memorize at least part of the Quran. But if we say at least another 10,000 memorize another good portion of the Quran. But anyhow, uh, people when they transmit the Quran from one generation to one generation, they choose the most skillful and most scholarly of the companions to transmit from, such as Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Ubay ibn Ka'b, Zayd ibn Thabit, Uthman ibn Affan, Umar ibn Khattab. Okay, those are the Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, Abu Darda. Those are the, the most knowledgeable Sahaba with regards to memorization and recitation of the Quran. Prophet ﷺ used to say that, Khud Quran an Arba, used to mention them by name, okay? So here you have uh, the, the level of the, the first level, which is the companions who took the Quran from Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay, so if I was to learn the Quran, this is on a scholarly and academic level. This is not because we have the whole nation transmitting the Quran from one level to the other, okay? Uh, for instance, even if we take a small community like Medicine Hat, we have so many people memorizing parts of the Quran or, or the whole Quran, even in a small city in the West like Medicine Hat, which you can't even find on the map sometimes. You have so many people who memorize portions of the Quran or the whole Quran, correct? Mm -hmm. And we are not really authoritative with regards to transmission of the Quran. We are just regular people. But all of us are also teaching our children. And we have maybe at least 100 children in Medicine Hat who memorize portions of the Quran, okay? But when you come to scholarly transmission and authoritative transmission, you take the Quran from the, from the highest scholars who, who, uh, who basically have mastered this skill and memorized every single letter of the Quran from beginning to end and make no mistake. So those are the Sahaba. Uh, there's at least eight of the Sahaba who are were considered the highest scholars, okay? And from those eight, basically, there's another level. This is one. This is only one reciter, okay? So uh, uh, we have we have ten of those. We have ten tables like this, such as this one, okay? So from that, from those uh, eight uh, uh, major scholarly Sahaba, uh, t uh, people, like, uh, for instance, Asim, uh, took, learned from, not just from one, he would learn from this one and this one and this one, go around and basically learn from multiple Sahaba. And then from him, he would transmit to other people to the second level and following until you have, these are not regular people, those are scholars and masters of recitation and you can see the numbers. But even those Sahaba, didn't live in one place. One of the good things that happened by the decree of Allah that the Sahaba dispersed throughout the Muslim land right away, even just towards the end of the life of the Prophet Muhammad So those people who took from them basically met them in different countries. For instance, we know Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he went to Iraq, he went to, he went to Kufa. We know Abu Darda went to Asham in Syria area. 
We know that uh, Ubay ibn Kaab remained uh, in, in, in Medina. We know that Ibn Abbas went to Mecca. All those are the scholarly Sahaba. So imagine the second generation taken from different people who dif dif different localities with no way of with no way of communication between those people. And then it ends up that everybody who learned from each Sahabi in, each, in his locality is reciting the exact same words and exact same letters. What does this tell you? That it is so reliable. Okay, what was taught in Iraq, for instance, in Iraq is the same thing that was taught in Syria, same thing taught in Medina, same thing taught in, in Mecca, and so on, throughout the Muslim land. And this is just one of them. This is, oh, for instance, how the, this is a chain of narration for the, uh, another qari, another reciter of the Quran. Uh, this is uh, Hamza, Hamza, uh, the, recite, uh, the reciter Hamza ibn Habib al-Zayyad. Okay, so you have here Jibreel, Jibreel, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the companions that learned from Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, here he had one, two, three, four, five, six. So for him he had Hamza, for instance he had six of the different companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he learned the Quran from, he didn't take from one person only. And then from him then you start, it starts spreading, okay? Yeah. From, uh, from each Sahabi, each Sahabi taught, look at this for instance, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. Mm -hmm. He taught Al-Qama ibn Qais. He taught Al-Aswad ibn Yazid. He taught, he taught Zir ibn Hubaysh. He taught Zayd ibn Wahb. He taught Masruq ibn Ajda. He taught Ubaidah al-Salmani. And so on. He taught so, he taught so many people. And each one of them has taught multiple people as well. And when you compare and contrast between what each reciter is reciting, it is exactly the same thing, okay? And those people lived in different places. There is no other logical conclusion from this except that it is preserved down to the, not only the letter, but to this every single sound and how much you stress on each letter and so on to the diacrit diacritical markings, to the dots, everything is preserved. And then another point is, so another point, when the Sahaba collected the Quran at the time of Abu Bakr Siddiq, it wasn't that because some people say, oh, the Quran was in danger of being lost. How could it be lost just because 70 of the memorizers died? No, it just, this event just drew their attention that, okay, now we lost 70 of the memorizers of the whole Quran. But we have another, we had a total of 10,000 of them, okay? Mm -hmm. But it, it just brought up the idea. What if things like this continue to happen and we continue to lose the memorizers? What if that they assumed what would happen? They, they, then they felt, okay, they had to have one official authoritative collection of the Qur'an. Although each one had his own collection. And Prophet ﷺ, in his house there was a collection. And the major Sahaba had their own collections of the whole Mus'haf. Okay? And if you, there's a hadith that even says, and that's, that shows that they even had the Qur'an in the same order we have. One of the second generation is asking one of the Sahaba, how did you... How did you guys used to recite the Quran from beginning to end? How did you used to divide it over the days? They said, we used to recite the first day, three surahs, which is Al-Baqarah. Uh, uh, they're talking about uh, Fatiha, Al-Baqarah, al Imran. And then the second day, we recite five surahs, okay? Al-Nisa, Al-Ma'idah, Al-An'am, Al-A'raf, and so on, okay? The third day, we recite seven surahs. They went from three, five, seven, nine, eleven, thirteen, and that would reach them, he says, to the end, to, to about Surah Qaf. If you count it, mm -hmm. you'll, you'll, you'll come to Surah Qaf, and then they, from Surah Qaf to the end of the Mus'haf. Mm -hmm. So they used to complete the whole Quran within six to seven, six to seven days. And they actually said, this is how they used to do it. What does this tell us? That the Quran was compiled in completion, in completion with the Sahaba, and they used to recite it in the same order that we have it today. So yes, that collection during the time of Abu Bakr Siddiq, it was just a precaution, but there was no danger. And this is evidenced by the fact that this collection remained with Abu Bakr Siddiq just in his house, and then it was transmitted to Omar bin Khattab as basically the official collection of the Quran. And then only when they needed it, when, when did they actually need it to bring it out and make copies of it? The time of Uthman ibn Affan. That's the 25th year. But immediately after the death of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi within months, they've collected that official official collection of the Quran, official compilation. But not that they needed it, because the Sahaba already memorized and each one had their copies, and it was, there was no danger. Only at the time of Uthman, when they felt that the second generation people, or people who came newly into Islam, could not comprehend the fact that there are different dialects, and they started fighting about this, that is when Uthman said, okay, I'm going to settle this dispute by bringing that authoritative official copy and distributing it to every place, 
and sending scholars and, uh, and, and, and the masters of recitation who memorize the Quran along with each, with each copy. So we have this oral transmission of the whole ummah, the whole nation of the Muslims, as we say, the regular people. Even those regular people as me and you, if I'm reciting in the Salah, I make a mistake, multiple people will correct me. So the whole ummah of Muslims from the time of the Prophet Muhammad were very diligent about memorizing the Quran letter by letter. And they transmitted to the children and so on. So the whole ummah transmitted. This is the tawatur. This is, uh, you cannot really argue with that. On top of that, we have scholars, and each of them has so many interlinking chains of narrations coming from different companions at different localities and all transmitting the same, the same thing. On top of that, we have only one text of the Quran, one single text of the Quran throughout history. There is not any other text. If there is another text, anybody who could challenge the authenticity of the Quran, bring us what is that other text. And one more important point is that people say, oh, the Muslims, uh, after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, at the time, just after Uthman ibn Affan, there was conflict, right? There's, there was internal conflict and strife and internal wars that happened, right? No. But, and, and then, and there was division in different factions, whether political factions or ideological, and ideological sects. But does any one of those sects, opposing sects, or factions that were fighting with each other, did they have different Quran? They still have the same Quran. Despite the fact that some of those sects and some of those factions fought against each other and some, many people were killed, but those were reciting the same Quran and those are reciting the same Quran. So despite of, our, of those big differences in opinion between those different factions of Muslims, still the Shia have the same Quran, the Sunnah have the same Quran, the Khawarij have the same Quran, the Mu'tazila, every single group had the same Quran. So even at the time of dispute, the Quran is the same up until now, and there's not. Those masahif given, written by, uh, at the time of Uthman, then after he sent out the authoritative official mushaf, which basically he copied from the, what was compiled right after the death of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by Abu Bakr Siddiq, uh, he sent them out, and that is, those were used basically to make copies of them. And those remained in existence up until uh, the ninth, uh, Hijri century, up, up until 800 years after the Prophet, after the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as evidenced by the fact that Muslim scholars like Ibn Kathir, for instance, who lived, uh, who died in the 8th century, he says he actually saw uh, uh, the Mus'haf of Uthman in the Amawi Mosque. Till today we have uh, those compilations uh, 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 in Masjid Hussein and also in other places that we think are the Uthmani, we think they are. But for sure, for sure, for sure, scientifically speaking, for sure they did exist until the 8th, 8th uh, century. Um, so any question about, uh, about this matter? Yes, Uthman, what, he, what did he burn? He, he asked the people to burn anything that people copied from each other. If people copied from each other, they're likely to make uh, mistakes. If you don't have an authoritative text that you can go back to, uh, that has no mistake whatsoever, it is likely that you can make mistakes. So he said, you, you have now the official authoritative uh, Quran that all the Muslims agree upon that this is exactly what was being recited during the life of Prophet Muhammad It was collected during the life of the people who lived with him and here it is. So there is no need for you to have other copies that you made that you could have copied from a copy from a copy from a copy. So everything was basically burnt. Those things that were against that, uh, that could have been uh, uh, have, having mistakes against that text. Any question about this process of compilation of the Quran and how it is preserved till today? I, I have a question. Yes. So when, when Muslimia uh, was killed, a lot of Sahaba uh, died in that. Yes, uh, 70, 70. Okay. 70 of the, of the, of the reciters. 500 that, to 700 of the Sahaba. Was that under uh, the Khilaf of uh, Abu Bakr Siddiq? So the process of compiling the Quran started then, if I remember. Within months, within months after the death of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu How long did it take? Because I mentioned that yesterday. 16 months. 16 months. 16 months because he had basically hundreds or maybe thousands of different parchments. He collected from, he collected from every the Sahaba, the things that they wrote in the presence of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi which on which two witnesses attested that it was written directly from the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu So once that was done, then uh, Uthman, 
he used that to make copies from. Okay. Uthman did not invent did not invent anything. He basically brought what was collected by the Sahaba right after that, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and made and made copies of. Now this is this is exactly the process that was narrated to us, and this is how we know it, uh, and we have the evidence for it, and the manuscripts that have been unearthed from the first century. And I showed you an article of 28 pages. I still have it. I showed it in the first like class. Uh, the manuscripts unearthed from the first century confirm exactly what we are saying are exactly identical to our oral transmission, okay? Mm -hmm. And that is basically a historical witness that comes back from that day that to witness today that what the Muslims have transmitted is exactly what was written during life. The, the manuscript of the University of Birmingham, you probably heard about it. This was written during the life of Prophet Muhammad because it was dated, it was dated exactly during the life. And I think probably that manuscript possibly could have been what was written uh, what was collected at the time of Bakr Siddiq because it was so skillful and uh, yani, uh, skillfully written. You see, you can go on the internet and see pictures of it. The lines are so straight, the letters are so clear, uh, and it is officially dated during the life of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or right after him, within the 10 years after him as well. So we can we can conclude because it doesn't look like a, it's a work of an individual. It looks like it's a, an official work. Okay, for the Quran, we have an official government supervising, supervising that. Okay, mm -hmm. for the Quran, there's no other book that, like that. We have a whole nation that participated in it. When when Zayd ibn Sabit collected the Quran, he he had this collection, and there was a collection that, at the house of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But he wanted the whole Ummah, the whole nation of Muslims at the time, the whole all the companions to participate, so that nobody doubts in the future. Okay, yeah. so that is why he collected. From all the uh, anybody who had something he wrote directly from Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam participated in what was written in that collection made during the life of Abu Bakr Siddiq months after the death of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So all the Sahaba were basically witnesses that this was what was uh, what was uh, recited by the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And if anybody anybody doubts that, bring us what was different. All the Muslims throughout history, this is what they have been reciting. If there was a single thing different from that, or any mistake or any omission by the by the passage of time and by transmission from one person to the other in the same generation and from one generation to the other, the mistakes and omissions are only going to increase. But that never happened. While other books, we don't even know their history, when they were collected and who collected them, who wrote them, we just don't know. There's no, they don't even know. The people of that, those religions don't even know. And those books just suddenly, uh, they say, okay, suddenly 200 years after Jesus, there was a book called uh, named the gospel, but it wasn't one gospel, you know, uh, I just, uh, for instance, uh, just to compare, you know how many gospels there are? How many? How many, how many do you think? Give me, give me a number. I collect it. No. Okay. Uh, okay. Even, even those gospels that are being used today, for instance, the, the gospel of Luke, it's not, there's not only one gospel of Luke, okay? There's a different one written by the first one who wrote the gospel book, a name called Marcion of Sinop, S-I-N-O-P-E. He had a different text than the Luke gospel that is accepted today. And he was the one, first one to write the uh, gospel of Luke. But it was different from today, today's, and they found that. There's a gospel of the uh, Gnostics, the Gnostic al -Ghunusiyin. Gnostics, they have 11 different gospels. Another Christian sect, early Christian sect, no. they have 11 different gospels. Uh, such as the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Philip, the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Judas, the Gospel of Marcion, the Gospel of Perfection, the Coptic Gospel of, e of, of Egyptians, uh, the Cosp Coptic Gospels uh, of, of the Greek. Uh, there's also another sect of Christianity called the Jewish Christians or the Ebionites. Those had four different Gospels. Uh, the Hebrews Gospels, the Nazarenes Gospels, uh, the Ebionites Gospel of the Twelve. And then you have other Gospels called the Infancy Gospels. Those were eight different Gospels, and there are more than other 20 Gospels that don't, they don't know which mm -hmm. sect they belong to. But those are things that they've been unearthing, and many of them, and of course they're totally different from what, what is considered as canonical today, totally different. Even the Gospel of Thomas, for instance, clearly says that uh, Jesus was not, uh, was not crucified. Uh, and, uh, and, and the Gospels of Ebionites, clearly say that Jesus was a messenger, a human being. He wasn't, uh, he wasn't God or the Son of God. So 
those gospels don't differ in a letter or two. They differ in the fundamentals of faith to what the Christians believe today. You understand what I'm trying to say? But anybody who challenges the Quran, bring me one Quran that is different even in one word, whether transmitted orally or by text. Bring me one Quran that's different. And when those Qurans that was compiled, or that were copied and sent out during the life of Uthman sent out, they were studied so extensively that Muslims counted the number of letters uh, in each one of them, the number of verses. Was, all this is counted, where the verse starts, or where it ends, where the surah starts, where it ends, where you're supposed to start a citation in a sentence, and where you best stop, and so on. Every, the number of diacritical marks were also counted. So we have books called uh, Ilm al Rasm, the science of uh, Rasm, how do you call that? Uh, the, the science of the text. Basically, that focuses on the, uh, the detailed description of the text itself, okay? And that, there are many, many books. So even of those, and of course, those Masahib of Uthman were copied by thousands, hundreds of thousands of people throughout generations, okay? And of course, the Quran was being delivered by hundreds of thousands of people throughout generations. And still, there's no difference. That, what does this tell you? It is the same text Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam decided will stop here, inshallah. Yeah. So, Shaykh, are there, uh, yes. are there any people that follow those uh, pastors today? Are there any Christian sects? Um, there are Christian sects, uh, such as the Unitarian Christians, for instance, okay. who, yani, uh, yani, who consider, uh, they don't uh, uh, accept the Trinity, for instance, they accept that there's God and then the, there's, uh, that Jesus he is a messenger of God, not a not a son of God. Or, yeah. And they also, yeah. and you have the Jehovah Witnesses who consider him a messenger. Yeah. 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 In fact, there, there's uh, one... Uh, Gospel according to Barnabas. Yes, the Gospel of Barnabas. The text was so...